I hope you're all enjoying it, catching up with some old friends, and of course, even more so, I hope you're making some new ones. There are a few people in this room that go to extraordinary lengths at the Chapel Foundation, and especially as part of this annual dinner, sorry about the popping, uh, with all of them donating their incredible experience and their most valuable time for free. That's for two reasons. Greg mentioned earlier, it's because they absolutely love doing what they do in um, ta tackling this homelessness of youth in Australia. But there is a second reason, and that is because they're all too afraid to say no to the chairman. <laughs> Darshak Mehta is the chairman. He really needs no introduction, but I'm going to give you one anyway. Would you please make him welcome? Well, well, nice. What do you think this is, Arjun? Respectable people, former prime ministers, former premiers, and you're playing this lady with the lascivious lips and thirsting hips? Jeez. What do we need to do to fix homelessness? Well, thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be a rather provocative speech, but I know you expect nothing less. I hope some of you shift uncomfortably in your seats. I hope some get upset, even angry. Yes, it is a strange technique of extracting money. But my objective is not to insult you or question your long-held beliefs or even apportion blame. Neither is to blame our two major political parties, even though they richly deserve it. It is to simply give you some context so here I go, foot firmly in the mouth, and I will stop occasionally just to change feet. <laughs> or when the emotion of my own arguments overcomes the idiot making them. <laughs> Are we as a country and populace determined to end homelessness or youth homelessness? No, a resounding no. If we were, the Chapel Foundation would not need to exist. In fact, I am sure as co-founders Greg and I would be happiest, as would be our board, if we didn't have to go around all year with a begging bowl. We have, as a country, fought every damn war waged in the world over the last 125 years. None on Australian soil, usually to suck up to the Yanks and the Brits or simply bail them out from their stupidity, vanity, or pig-headedness. And we have tragically, in that process, lost an entire MCG population of young men for this appeasement. But we refuse to fight the one war which is most pressing and which is on our soil, the war on homelessness. I apologize for using the word war for it implies violence, trauma, suffering, and death. But the homeless experience all of these disproportionately anyway. 
we have all the weapons to control, to combat homelessness. Just simply not the will or the backbone. It is galling. On census night in 2016, 19,400 kids aged between 0 to 14 were classified as homeless. What kind of country are we to look away when this is happening in our society? Here is the polemic. How do we always manage to find the money to shower private schools which charge students $40,000 a year or keep building stadiums or find a billion dollars a year for upkeep of the refugees who are here because of the wars we waged in their countries and we now lock up in Pacific gulags and have thrown the key away. Or order eight tokenistic nuclear-powered submarines for delivery 18 years from now, hoping that these tinnies will dissuade the 530 ships of the People's Liberation Army Naval Force. Or find 600 million for car parks which no one even wanted. Or half a billion dollars for the Australian War Memorial. Or give away 13 billion dollars of job keeper funds to companies whose businesses actually improved vastly. Forget going backwards during the pandemic. But we can't find enough funds to build modest, basic homes for those who need them most? Do we want to keep them begging in our streets or push drugs or turn to violent crime to make a living? Can we afford $125,000 a year to then maintain them in jail without a hope in hell of reforming them? If you share my indignation, let's have an insurrection. Revolutions are not the result of sane minds. They need empty stomachs and angry minds. All I need is a glass of Ponting's Shiraz. <laughs> Our board had an interesting meeting last year with James Allen. James, at age 22, in 1995, summited Mount Everest. Talk to him. He's a fascinating guy and totally mad and is with me on table 29. <laughs> James shook us all up. He said, stop talking about amelioration of youth homelessness and start demanding elimination and working towards it. We saw the crazed look in his eyes and hurriedly thanked him. But you know what? He is absolutely right. Why should we not build homes furiously for our homeless? And are we not one of the world's most affluent countries? Finland managed to lick homelessness, so why can't we? How long are we going to keep making excuses about balancing our budget? We better decide whether we are living in an economy or a society. These are vulnerable people. 
They are vulnerable people we are throwing on the scrap heap. Without a thought, are we only going to notice them when we have a slum at Martin Place or here in Driver Avenue? Many questions, but the answer is the bleeding obvious. Build more, much more, tens of thousands more of social housing every year. Youth homelessness, indeed all homelessness, is a blight on our country and a scandalous failure of government. Social housing will not solely fix the problem of youth homelessness, but by golly, it is a great start. And everything else can follow and help. Before I conclude, I want to thank our board of directors and treasurer, an extremely passionate and committed group of men and women who never shy away from rolling up their sleeves. So thank you very much, guys. You wouldn't believe how hard they have slogged to make this evening possible. Greg, of course, is the greatest help I get at all times. They say, never meet your heroes. He is the glaring exception. We happen to know how hard it is to put an evening like this together. Two months ago, I even had a few isolated strands. <laughs> I also know how hard it can be to herd 10 people together for your table unless they have paid for the table. Some people have little commitment. Executive assistants get driven batty by the musical chairs and loose hair without even undergoing chemotherapy. The fact that you still continue to do this and come and support us is simply overwhelming. Thank you very much. <laughs> Allow me to flatter you with all the sincerity the false sincerity I can pretend. It is your support that keeps us going and trying to help desperate, lost souls and give them hope. We are touched that 508 of you have showed up to listen to me. Sorry, I meant to say Pat. <laughs> Pat Cummins a young man all of Australia should be proud of, and is. And those of you who haven't paid, we know your names. And with some difficulty, even your diets. The rest is easy. So just do the gracious things as guests do. We are giving you plenty of opportunities to stack up the bank of good karma. Generosity and compassion arise only when the prefrontal cortex is able to throttle back the more prehistoric regions of the brain. Alcohol facilitates this effortlessly. Try it. Do it. Please. Please. And now, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce Australia's greatest auctioneer, a mad marathoner who has done it in two hours and 50 minutes. He's an ultra-marathoner as well, Damien Cooley.
please, please, please spend money you haven't earned to buy things you don't want to impress the people you don't like. <laughs>